Just a quick reminder before we get into the lesson to download the hands-on lab exercises that accompany this full CCNA course. I'll include the link in the description. Also, remember to subscribe and hit the notifications bell so you don't miss any of the lessons in the course. Okay, let's get into it. In this lecture, you'll learn how OSPF routers form adjacencies with each other and build their link state databases. Let's start with a recap of OSPF operations as you saw near the start of this section. So when you enable OSPF on a router, first off, it will discover its OSPF neighbors, it will form adjacencies with them, and it will then build the link state database which contains all of the networks that it's learned about from OSPF. It will compute the shortest path to each of those networks and install the best route in its routing table. And then if anything changes on the network, for example, a link going down, then the router will respond to network changes and update its routing table accordingly. We are going to focus on the first three in this lecture, that's discovering neighbors, forming adjacencies and building the link state database. So let's look at the OSPF packet types again as well. The different types of packets that can be sent in the OSPF messages, we have the hello packet, a router will send out and listen for hello packets when OSPF is enabled on an interface. So when you enable OSPF on the router globally, and then when you enable OSPF on interfaces with the network statements, then the router is going to start sending out and listening for hello packets. And it will form adjacencies with other OSPF routers on those links. DBD database description packets, adjacent routers will tell each other the networks they know about with the DBD packet. And LSR is a link state request. If a router is missing information about any of the networks in the DBDs that it receives from its neighbors, it will send that neighbor an LSR, a request for more information about it. LSA is a link state advertisement, that's a routing update. And LSU is a link state update that contains a list of LSAs which should be updated. That is used during flooding. For example, if a link has gone down, and LSAC, receiving routers, acknowledge LSAs. So when they receive a packet from OSPF with information from them, they will send an acknowledgement back to the router that sent it. Okay, so now let's have a look at how that all works in more detail. So starting off with the hello packets, OSPF routers discover each other and form adjacencies with each other via the hello packets. They send hello packets out each interface where OSPF is enabled, except passive interfaces. If you remember on passive interfaces, we don't want to be sending information out there, sharing updates about our internal networks. So on passive interfaces, whichever network is configured on those interfaces will be advertised internally. So our internal routers know about that network, but we're not gonna be giving out any of our internal information out on that link. So typically you're gonna have passive interfaces configured where you're connected to a third party that you don't want to be sharing your routing information with. We also enable passive interfaces on our loopback interfaces as well. So the way that we enable OSPF on an interface is by enabling OSPF globally, and then we enter a network statement, which includes the IP subnet that is on that particular link. When we do that, it turns on OSPF and interface, it's gonna start sending out and listening for hellos. When these hello packets are sent out, they're multicast to the multicast address 224.0.0.5, that is designated as the all OSPF routers multicast address. And hello packets are sent every 10 seconds by default. So even after a router has formed an adjacency with the router on the other side of the link, it will still keep sending hello packets every 10 seconds. Because as well as forming the adjacency and exchanging routes with each other, the routers want to make sure that the other router is still up. If that router goes down, then obviously we're not going to be able to send any traffic through it. So the router is going to want to know about that. The way it finds out is by they keep sending each other hello packets. If a router sees that a neighbor has stopped sending hello packets to it, it'll realize that that router must have gone down. The contents of the hello packet. We've got the router ID. 
Joker, it's a 32-bit number, looks just like an IPv4 address that uniquely identifies each OSPF router. The hello interval is how often the router sends hello packets, and this defaults to 10 seconds. The dead interval is how long a router waits to hear from a neighbor before declaring it out of service. So as I was just saying, another purpose of the hello packets other than discovering neighbors is to discover if they're still there or not. If a router has not received a hello packet for the dead interval from a neighbor, it assumes that that neighbor has gone down. And the default for the dead interval is four times the hello interval. So if you don't change the timers, then the hello interval will be 10 seconds and the dead interval will be 40 seconds. If you change the hello interval to 20 seconds, that will automatically update the dead interval to 80 seconds because it's default four times the hello interval. You can change these in delayed individually if you want to as well though. Okay, so let's talk for a second about these timers. If you want your network to react more quickly to changes, then you can turn these down. But be careful if you do that because that can then cause instabilities. If you have any kind of delay in the network, it can cause routers to think that links or other routers have gone down and that is obviously going to cause problems. So very often you will leave the, the timers at their defaults. If you do want to change them, be careful that you know what, you do, what you're doing before you do that. Okay, next thing in the hello packet is a list of neighbors. So a list of adjacent OSPF neighbors that this router has received a hello packet from. So this OSPF router, maybe it's got multiple different interfaces. It's got OSPF neighbors on each of those different interfaces. Well, when it sends a hello packet out each interface, it will include the list of all its neighbors in that hello packet. Still got more. We also have the area ID. You remember that OSPF routers, if it's an ABR, it can have interfaces which are in multiple different areas. So the, the area is configured on the link on the interface level. That information is sent in the hello packet that is sent out that particular link. Also, the router priority. This is an 8-bit number used to select the DR, the designated router, and the BDR, the backup designated router. I'll speak about those more a little bit later in this lecture. If the a DR and BDR exist and the router knows about them, then the IPv4 address is also going to be included in the hello packet. Authentication flag, if authentication is configured. So it's best practice that you do do this. When you're configuring OSPF in a real world enterprise environment, you want to include a password in your OSPF configuration. So then the routers on both sides need to have a matching password. This stops somebody either accidentally or maliciously joining a router to your network and advertising routes there. Because if you think about it, if you didn't have authentication in OSPF, it would be very easy for an attacker, if they had physical access, to plug a router in and then start advertising bogus routes into your network, which could cause traffic to get black holed. So you want to make sure that that doesn't happen. More likely it would happen accidentally by somebody taking an old router out of a cupboard and plugging it in, something like that. So make sure that doesn't happen. Make sure that you do have authentication configured in OSPF for real world networks. You don't need to know about it for the CCNA exam. The last thing in the hello packet contents is the stub area flag. If this indicates if the area is a stub area. Stub areas have a default route to their ABR rather than learning routes outside of their area. So with a stub area, there's just one way in and out of it, which is the ABR. It puts less load on the routers in that stub area if rather than learning all the routes everywhere in the network, they just know how to get to their ABR. So they know how to get to everywhere inside their own area. To get out of their area, they just send traffic to the ABR via a default route. It means that the router has got less information, less load on that router. These particular settings in the hello packet must match for a pair of OSPF routers to form an adjacency with each other. So they must be in each other's neighbor list. Now, when you first see this, you're probably going to think, well, wait, how, when I first plug a router in, it's going to send the hello packet out. It doesn't have any neighbors yet. I've just plugged it in. So how is it going to be able to form any adjacencies? Well, you'll see in, in a second, it doesn't just happen after one packet the routers go through a little bit of a negotiation, discover each other, and then they'll form an adjacency. I'll show you in a second. 
the hello and dead intervals have to be the same. This is another reason why people will often leave the timers at the default. Because if you do change the timers, you have to make sure that you change them on every single router in your network. They all have to match or the routers are not going to form an adjacency with each other. The area ID has to be the same. Again, this is at the link level. So a router could have different links, different interfaces in different areas. But when a router sends a whole pack out of a particular interface, if it's going to appear form an adjacency with another OSPF router on that same link, they both need to be configured to be in the same area. The IP subnet has to be the same as well. And if you think about it, well, they definitely should be. If the IP subnets were different, there's definitely something wrong there. The authentication flag has to be the same. So if a password is configured on OSPF on one side, you have to have a matching password on the other side as well. And if the router on that particular interface is configured to be in a stub area, all other routers in that area must also be configured that it's a stub area as well. If anything mismatches there, then the adjacency just will not come up. Okay, so let's have a look at the neighbor states as the routers go through the process of forming an adjacency with each other. You can see I've got R1 on the left. On this interface here, it's got IP address 172.16.1.1 24. And on this interface, it's got IP address 10.0.0.1 slash 30. Now, for this example, we have not configured a loopback interface on the router. So it's going to use the highest physical address for its router ID. 172 is higher than 10. So this is going to be the router ID here. In a real world environment, you would configure a loopback address here. But just to save some space on the slide here, I don't have a loopback. Okay, and over here on the right, the router is connected to R2, so this will have to be in the same subnet on this interface here. It is, it's 10.0.0.2 slash 30. And this router also has got an interface on the 172.16.2.1 slash 24 network. So we configure OSPF on our routers. We want R1 to learn about the 172.16.2.0 slash 24 network. And we want R2 to learn about the 172.16.1.0 network. Okay, so we have enabled OSPF globally on our routers and we've configured a network statement which includes the 10.0.0.0 slash 30 network on both R1 and R2. So R1 and R2 will now start sending out hello packets on that interface trying to discover OSPF routers and form an adjacency with them. So we've just done this on R1. So it sends out a hello packet saying I am router ID 172.16.1.1. I've just had the OSPF enabled, so I have no neighbors. Again, notice this packet is going out on the 10.0.0.1 interface, but the router ID is 172.16.1.1. That does not have to match. The router ID is basically a number. It could be anything. It's just an identifier. It's not the same as the IP address on the interface. Okay, so it sends that out. And it sends it with a source address of 10.0.0.1, the address on the interface. The destination address is the multi-cast address 224.0.0.5. Any other OSPF routers on that link are listening for traffic that is going to that multi-cast address. So R2 is going to be listening for it. So R2 sees the packet, and then it sees that it came from the address 10.0.0.1. So it sends a reply back saying, I'm router ID 172.16.2.1, and I see 172.16.1.1. So if it had any other OSPF neighbors right now, it would include them in this information. So it tells R1 about all of its neighbors, including R1. That is unicast to 10.0.0.1, where the first packet from R1 came from, and it is sent from R2's address of 10.0.0.2. Then R1 sees this, and then it sends a reply, I am router ID 172.16.1.1, and I see 172.16.2.1, because it just learned about 172.16.2.1. And again, that is unicast to 10.0.0.2. So now we've fulfilled that requirement that the routers have to see each other in their neighbor list, because you can see that that has been done here. Okay, and once that has been done, the routers are in a two-way state. So they've established two-way communication with each other for OSPF. They haven't started exchanging any routes yet though. Next up, they move into the exchange state. So at this point, 
R1 sends a database descriptor packet saying, I will start exchange with my router ID 172.16.1.1. This will come from one or the other routers. And then R2 replies back with a database descriptor saying, no, I'm going to start exchange because I had the higher router ID on 172.16.2.1. So this is just a negotiation about who is going to start the exchange. Doesn't really matter which one it is anyway, but it's going to be the one with the highest router ID. Okay then we're going to start exchanging routing information with each other so r2 sends a database descriptor this is a summary of its link state database so it doesn't send full information because r1 maybe already has the information it would be inefficient to send everything so it just sends a summary about the networks that it knows about that includes 172.16.2.0 24 that comes into R1, and then R1 will send an acknowledgement back. This traffic is, by the way, of course, all unicast, being unicast from R2 to R1 there. R1 then sends a unicast back, saying it acknowledges that that packet was received. Then R1 will also send its LSDB summary to R2, again with a database descriptor, and R2 will send an acknowledgement back to R1 so that R1 knows that it did get there. Next up, we move into the loading state or the loading stage. So R2, it saw the summary from R1 saying that R1 knows about 172.16.1.0 slash 24. R2 doesn't know anything about that. So it will send a link state request back saying, please send me full info about the 172.16.1.0 slash 24 network. And then R1 will send an LSU, a link state update reply with the full information about that link and how to get there. R1 also sends a link state request to R2 asking for information about 172.16.2.0 and R2 will send a link state update back to R1 with the full information. So they've now exchanged information with each other. R1 will send an acknowledgement back to R2 saying it got the information. R2 will send an acknowledgement back to R1 saying that it got its information. And at that stage, they're in the full state because they've got an adjacency with each other and they've exchanged the routing information with each other as well. Okay, so that is how adjacencies are formed. That's how it works on a point-to-point -point link. There's a little bit of a difference on multi-access segments such as Ethernet. They use DRs and BDRs, the designated routers. I'll explain about that in the next lecture. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to get the complete course ad-free right now, then you can click on the link above my head or in the description to enroll in my CCNA Gold Bootcamp. It also includes full study notes, quizzes, and 150 pages of additional troubleshooting labs you can't find anywhere else.